Hi, I'm Kathleen Jasper, and today we're going to talk about data-driven decision-making and how we can use it in our classrooms to become better educators. Let's get started. So not too long ago, I did a video on how to answer questions in the teacher interview. And I mentioned that you should convey to the principal or to the interview team that you are a data-driven instructor, that you use data to make decisions in your classroom. Well, that's something that's relatively easy to say and not so easy to do in our practice. So today we're going to talk about these things and how to implement it in the classroom. First, let's go over the two types of data that you will collect as an educator. The first one is quantitative data. This is data that can be quantified in numbers. So examples are test scores, reading levels, anything that has a number by it is quantitative data. Now, qualitative data is data that cannot be quantified in numbers. So those are things like observations, surveys, conversations. That is called qualitative data, and it is just as important as quantitative data. And when you use both qualitative and quantitative data together, you get a better picture or a better story of what's going on with your students. Now, you might also hear data referred to as formative data or summative data, also called formative assessment or summative assessments. Now, formative assessments are those used to inform your instruction. The data that you get from formative assessments helps you decide how you're going to move on the next day, the next week, or even the next minute, depending on what you're doing. So that is used to inform. Think formative, inform instruction. Summative data is used to measure outcomes. So it's usually done at the end of learning. So there is no more reteaching or anything like that. The summative data is used to see how they do. Did they get it? Or a summative assessment might be like a state standardized assessment at the end of the year. It's final. You get a read of what the students know and what they don't know. Now, formative and summative assessments can both contain quantitative and qualitative data. For example, a formative assessment can include an observation where you're walking around the room and observing your students, how they're interacting in a science lab or in cooperative work. That is formative data. And it's also qualitative. It's not numbers. You're using your observation. You might be writing down some anecdotal notes. So that is both qualitative and formative. But you could also administer a quick quiz for your students where you get a quick score in numbers and you use that information to determine what you're going to do the next day. So that would be a formative assessment using quantitative data. Now, of course, summative data typically is done through quantitative measures. So students are taking a multiple choice test at the end of a unit or a lesson, or they're taking that state standardized assessment, and usually they get a score. So summative is typically, not all the time, represented by quantitative data. Now, qualitative data on a summative assessment might look like an essay question. So you might get a score on an essay, but typically when you're looking at student writing, it would be considered qualitative data because you're actually looking at how they structured the sentence and things like that. So you can turn it into a quantitative measure, perhaps by using a rubric and giving it a score. But sometimes on a summative assessment, you might be looking at their writing and that's more of a qualitative measure. Now, in terms of everyday classroom instruction and things like that, you're going to use a lot of formative assessments and qualitative data. So let me give you an example. Let's say that students are working in their cooperative learning groups and they are going through some questions. Maybe it's a science class and they're going through some questions and you're walking around the room observing your students and trying to figure out how they're doing and you're there to support them when needed. As you walk around, you see though that students are struggling with one particular question. Let's say it's question number five and you go over to group one and you see group one is like, I don't really understand this question and they're all kind of struggling. And then you walk over to group two and they're kind of saying the same thing and you walk over to group three and they're struggling with that same question. Well, that indicates to me that perhaps my question wasn't worded the right way, or maybe they don't have the skills necessary to get to that question yet. So I might then make a decision to stop the cooperative learning momentarily and go over that question as a whole group on the board with me guiding the students. So notice I collected that formative data that was also qualitative because it's my observation. And then I decide uh, they're all kind of struggling with this. Let me stop them so we can stop the frustration and let's get those skills 
in line so that they can move forward in the cooperative learning a little bit better. So I made that decision and I might say, hey guys, let's stop. Let's go over number five. You all seem to be struggling with that one a little bit. Let's talk about it so you can get through that. That's a data-driven decision. I collected data and made a decision to stop and support the students in a whole group activity momentarily before moving on. So after the lesson is over, I might pass out sticky notes and have students write down one question they still have about the reading or the instruction that we just did. So we're at the end of the class. I'm thinking everybody got it. They're all doing pretty good. We are going to wrap things up and the last five minutes of class, I'm handing out those sticky notes and I say, guys, please write down one question you still have or one thing you're still confused about regarding the lesson. And so they do their little thing and then once they're done, I collect all the sticky notes, they leave or we move on to math block if you're an elementary teacher. But I have those sticky notes and as I'm going through them, I see that 70% of the class has that same question. Well, what does that tell me? That tells me I should go over that tomorrow or the next day in order to get those students up to speed. So that's another way in which we use data to make instructional decisions. And it's very powerful. That is a piece of qualitative data that can really help your students get better at the learning because you just focused on one thing that most of the students need help at. You would not have known that had you not given them those little exit slips to write that down. So exit slips are a very powerful tool to collect formative qualitative data. Now, one way in which you might use quantitative formative data is let's say you're starting a lesson on photosynthesis. Let's just say you're a science teacher and you wanna see what students already know about photosynthesis and maybe some misconceptions they have. Lots of people have misconceptions when it comes to science and it's always good to understand that before going into a lesson. So you might give the students a little pre-quiz or pre-test. It's not really graded. You're not putting it in the grade book, but you're trying to figure out where the students are so you know where to go next when starting the lesson. So you might give them a five or 10 question quiz that helps you understand where students are in their learning, where there are holes and where you can take them moving forward. And so you collect those quizzes and you look at the scores and you look at the questions they got correct or incorrect. You analyze, you disaggregate the data, you dig down into the data and look and see, and that'll tell you a story of where you need to go in the following lesson, another way in which to use formative data to make instructional decisions. Now, how would we use summative data to make instructional decisions? Well, summative data is at the end, so there really isn't much to do at the end of learning. You are measuring outcomes, but here's one way in which it would really help you in the classroom. So let's say you give students a pretest, and you go through and you realize that they're all kind of struggling in one area, so you make sure you focus on that area during your instruction. And as you are moving through the lesson or the chapter or the unit, you are formatively assessing through observation, maybe some follow-up quizzes, maybe some writing assignments. You're collecting all of those assignments, looking at them and watching your student progress. Meanwhile, you are implementing strategies that you think are gonna help the students so that they understand the information. So these could be reading strategies, math strategies, whatever content area you are, you're implementing those best practices in order to help help your students achieve. Well, at the end, you give them a summative assessment. And that's where you can measure if your strategies worked. So if they did, if the outcomes were good, then you know you could use those same types of strategies moving forward in subsequent units. If the outcomes weren't good, you need to sort of take a look at the practice and say, did this really work? Was I clear enough? Did that strategy really meet the needs of my students? And it'll help you evaluate your practice. So as you develop your practice, you are doing it in an effective way. And finally, we use data in our professional learning communities. We get together with other teachers in our content areas or on our grade level teams. We talk about formative assessments, summative assessments. We disaggregate down into the data, meaning we're not just looking at the surface score. We're actually digging down deeper and seeing what specific skills the students are lacking, and we're coming up with ways together on how to help those students implementing those and then retesting and determining how students are doing based on those strategies and things we decided to put in place. Now, all of this takes a lot of practice because on top of collecting data, giving assessments, walking around the room and observing, you're dealing with behavior, lunchtime, recess, grades in the grade book, parent teacher conferences, faculty meetings, you name it, you are getting hit with it in all different directions. And so go easy on yourself as you implement this type of data collection 
in your classroom, but you can just start small, start walking around the room. And when you observe something, write it down or use that exit slip strategy that I talked about and make that part of your practice. Whatever it is, try to do some sort of data collection and data analysis as you move forward in deciding what you're going to do in your classroom and practice. Practice, practice, practice. All of this takes time. You're not going to be a effective teacher right out the gate. It's going to take a lot of trial and error and falling on your face and not knowing what you're doing. And pretty soon you will get better and you will understand your practice more and more by doing this sort of reflective data collection and data-driven decision-making. All right. I hope that helps you when it comes to your practice. Remember, do your best to be data-driven. Don't just say it in an interview. Make sure you're implementing it in the classroom. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Bye.